Well, the next step is what about faith? Is faith a leap into the illogical? I mean, that's a statement that that's where a lot of people uh, feel like they are in, uh, 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 in terms of uh, this issue of faith. It's amazing how confusing a simple thing like faith can be. Uh, and the, the contrast is, is uh, and you'll see on this part of the chart where I have that circle, fideism versus faith. Fideism versus faith. And, and you first go, you know, kind of freak out, what's this word fideism? And we'll, we'll talk about it. I want to I define that for you. What is fideism and what is faith? Because what some people pass off as faith is really not uh, uh, just a, a blind leap. It's they're, they're not using reason at all. And it's actually a position uh, uh, theologically and philosophically. Uh, uh, one writer, Alvin Plantinga, uh, says that a fideist is someone who urges reliance on faith rather than reason. In other words, I don't have to have a reason to believe, I just believe. Now there's a weakness to that position, right? The weakness is, is I can believe in Santa Claus too, right? And so if I'm believe, you know, I can believe in a lot of things and, and they don't really exist. And so that's the, the weakness of it, but it's reliance on faith rather than reason and mainly in matters that are philosophical and religious. And then they become disparaging or denigrate reason. They put it down. Um, Soren Kierkegaard was a Dutch theologian. Uh, he came up with this idea of this leap of faith. And, and his statement is, his concept is, a person is faced with a choice that cannot be justified rationally, and therefore he has to leap into it. The leap of faith is therefore a leap into faith which is allowed by it, stemming from a paradoxical contradiction between the ethical and the religious. In other words, there's just this paradox, this con uh, the contradiction, and you go ahead and believe it anyway, even though there's seemingly a contradiction. Blaise Pascal said that uh, he talked about a cost-free faith. In fact, one of the things that he did was he kind of talks about this wager. And this wager, this great wager, is... Um, uh, and, and I remember using this when I was a student at UT uh, uh, and, and I was taught it. I didn't know it came from Blaise Pascal. I didn't know any of that. But it was basically this wager of basically if I am right and there is a God and Jesus Christ is the son of God, what are you losing by putting your faith in Christ? But if I'm uh, and, and, and you don't you don't I mean, you gain eternity. But. If I'm wrong, you don't lose anything. But if, I, if, if I'm right, you lose everything. And so I, you know, I use that as a persuasive device to try to lead people to Christ. And I thought, you know, I, that's really a fideistic approach. It's really encouraging somebody to take a step that they don't really believe or to take just a belief step that they really have no reason for. And so I, as I looked at Blaise Pascal's wager, I thought, you know, I, I'm not sure that I would ever use that again uh, because I don't, I don't think it's a, the, the right approach. I love Galileo's, uh, Galilei's reasonable faith. I don't feel obligated to believe that the same God who has endowed us with the sense of reason and intellect has intended us to forgo their use. In other words, we should be using reason. We should be using uh, our thoughts. I mean, God gave us a brain for a reason. Many people think that Christians are someone who takes their brain and puts it on the shelf. And they just believe. And they're thinking about blind, blind belief, blind faith. Uh, even theologians, Anselm, uh, an early church father, he made this statement. I do not seek to understand in order that I may believe, but rather I believe in order that I may understand. You look at that statement, at first that sounds very, you know, uh, interesting, at least. Uh, but in fact, he gets this idea from um, uh, Augustine. Augustine uh, uh, came up with, believe so that you may understand. And so all he added, Anselm, was, I, I believe in order that I may understand. In other words, faith somehow leads me to belief. Um, 
And it's interesting, this idea that all those examples, uh, Anselm and, uh, uh, and, and uh, Blaise Pascal, and I mean, all these are, are examples of fideism. And, and, and the reality is you think, oh, well, I'm not sure that I've ever heard this before, ever ex been exposed to this before. And the reality is, yes, you have. Everybody, any of y'all watched the Santa Claus movie? And you remember Judy the elf saying, seeing isn't believing, believing is seeing. That's a statement of fideism, that you believe no matter what the reasons are, no matter what uh, 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 reality tells you, no matter, uh, you just believe. And the interesting thing about that is, is that it's, not, it's very prevalent in movies. The Lego movie, I didn't watch this movie. Um, maybe some of you have that you have younger kids. Uh, all you have to do is believe, then you will see everything. That's uh, Vitruvius, uh, which is uh, Morgan Freeman's character. Uh, he's supposed to be, I guess, this wide sage. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, I, I have, didn't watch, but it, uh, just a little clip, and I thought, okay, this must be who he is. So this is an idea of fideism as well. Um, an old movie. Miracle on 34th Street. How many of you watched this during Christmas time? Uh, and and uh, uh, Doris Walker, who's Maureen O'Hara's character, is talking to her daughter Susan. She says, faith is believing something when common sense tells you not to. And you realize that's a statement of fideism. That's just a, and it's so it's, it's prevalent in our movies. It's, it's all over the place, this idea that, and, and in fact, you remember, uh, she's sitting there by herself on this bench and she says, I believe, I believe, it's silly, but I believe. You know, and of course now, what is she believing? Santa Claus, right? So this isn't even belief in, in, in Christ. If, you, if you're just fideism, I mean, you can really prove belief in anything. I mean, you can, you can believe in Wicca, you could believe in Hinduism, you could believe in Islam. I mean, you use that same argument for all these different things. And so the reality is you need to have a reasonable faith, a reason why we believe what we believe. Uh, this guy, Karl Barth, was, uh, when I was working, uh, uh, I spent a couple of years working on a doctorate, a PhD uh, at, at Southwestern, and, and we had to read a lot of Karl Barth. And Karl Barth, uh, his idea was that, that, uh, that you can't reason your way to God. And, and, and if you notice it in, in this uh, presentation, the Buckles Barometer, is this idea of apologetics. And all of apologetics is using reason. What are the, is, it, is it a reasonable faith that we have, or is it just this blind faith that we have, that we're just kind of, you know, uh, Christians kind of going along, bopping along, doot, 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 you know, and we're just believing whatever, you know, whatever we're told, or do we use our brain? Have we put our brain on the shelf, or do we have a reasonable faith? And there's a lot of uh, deep reasons why we believe. But I, I remember in, in, in this class with uh, uh, dealing with Karl Barth, Karl Barth had the idea that you cannot reason your way to God. You have to start with God's revelation. He reveals himself to you, and then you respond to his revelation. Well, there's a certain amount of that that's true, but to, put, to say that we can't reason our way at all is, is, is problematic because God gives us his word, and his word expects us to be able to reason what he means. And what he has said. So even if you talk about revelation, you're using reason. And even Karl Barth, who said belief cannot argue that idea of reason with unbelief, it can only preach to it. And so is that true that we can only preach? But what are you preaching? You're preaching reasonable arguments of why somebody should believe, right? Right. And so God's word anticipates reason. Uh, even this statement right here, if I believe or don't believe this statement, uh, uh, can I, do I have a reasonable uh, 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 or a reason why I don't believe it? Uh, now, the opposite of that, uh, of, of reason, is this idea of rationalism, that you don't really need faith, you're only needing reason. Uh, and it's, uh, rationalism is the practice or principle of basing opinions and actions on reason and knowledge rather than on religious belief or emotional response. And so it's this idea that I, it's either faith or reason. And the reality is we need both. 
God has given us both. He's given us faith. He's given us the ability to reason. He's given me a brain. He wants me to use it. As Galileo said, he doesn't want me to set it on the shelf or just ignore it or just be like Susan in the Miracle on 34th Street. I believe, I believe it's silly, but I believe, you know, I mean, that's, God doesn't want that either. God, has, uh, God is brilliant and God reasons with us. Come, let us reason together, scripture says in Isaiah. And so there's this idea that reason is an important part of our uh, relationship. Now, if you think about reason, there's also the idea of empiricism. And I just want to address that briefly. Empiricism uh, uh, stresses the senses that I can know things because I touch, taste, feel. Uh, and that's how I know things. That's how I know truth. That's how I have knowledge. Rationalism stresses the mind that I just, I just think my way through the process. Um, they're not the same thing. Uh, one argues for innate principles or ideas. The other sees the mind as the tabla rasa or the blank slate. That we were born with nothing and then, and then society and our experiences inform and begin to write on the tablets of our, our minds. I had a... Uh, I, I, I was a music major in college. I had a professor that held that uh, our minds were basically a blank slate and that society was writing on it, uh, uh, behavior modification. I mean, all these different things were, were writing, culture was writing on this blank slate and that we have nothing that is in aid except maybe the ability to breathe or the ability to our hearts to beat uh, uh, or a few other uh, aspects um, like, like a child being able to suck, you know, they are not taught that as something that they have early on. Uh, but when you look at scripture, it seems to indicate that we aren't a blank slate. Uh, and this is the New American Standard. I love the way it words it. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them. That within us, we have this innate sense that there is a God. Uh, I, to me, that's the, um, uh, it's part of the anthropological argument and a little bit of part of the ontological argument that there's this concept of God that we all have. You can go anywhere in the world and, and anywhere in the world, people have a concept of a being higher than themselves. You can, uh, you can go to Irin Jaira and there uh, might be a group of people that are cannibalistic, but they're worshiping trees and the sun and everything else. And they haven't been touched by culture. And you think, where do they get that? Where do they get that idea? I think that written on us is God himself, that he wrote himself onto our conscience, onto this, onto our lives. We're not a blank slate. We have God written there on our, in our lives. And we have this craving for him, even though no one has ever seen him. And I think that that's something that's powerful. And when you, when you see what Paul is saying in Romans one, that, that we're without excuse because we can look at creation and know there is a God that there's some higher being that's created all things and that he wants to be related to us. And in fact, Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee, that we have this God-shaped hole in our hearts that longs to be filled only with God. And we try to fill it with everything else in this world. We try to fill it with material possessions. We try, we, we try to fill it with, with love, with, with uh, relationships, with whatever, with joy, with hedonism. We try to fill this hole. And the only thing that satisfies fully is God himself. And so uh, we are not this blank slate, but we, are, uh, we have, been, have God written on our hearts. And so this idea that... Um, of rationalism, I thought it was interesting that rationalism's approach usually uh, appreciates the ontological argument where empiricists who have uh, the, the touch, taste, feel idea uh, tend to lean toward the cosmological argument. And what, so what you'll find is, is that when you're talking to somebody, you don't know which perspective they're coming from. And, and sometimes one argument will work. You think, man, this one really worked well with the last person. And so you're trying it with the next person and it's not working at all. It's because they're a different person. And so I think that that's the, the beauty of the different arguments for the existence of God. If you remember, they spell taco, teleological, ontological, cosmological, uh, 
anthropological, cosmological, ontological, taco, I, I can't spell. Uh, <laughs> I can say fancy Greek words, but I can't spell, right? Taco. Uh, but, uh, and it means that there's the argument of design. If there's a design, there's a designer. If there's morals, there's a moral lawgiver. If there's an effect, then there has to be an adequate cause for that effect, and we're an effect. So therefore, there has to be an adequate cause. Uh, we're a personal effect, therefore a personal cause, God. Then the ontological is being. Uh, and so um, uh, there's uh, these, these different arguments uh, are, are important for us to know because certain people will respond to different ones. Now, as we talked about, fideism is the doctrine that knowledge depends on faith or revelation. So it's knowledge first, uh, I mean, it's faith first and then knowledge. It's faith first and then reason. Uh, and faith sometimes does come first. If you look at uh, 2 Peter 1, 5 to 7, uh, it says, For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and with virtue with knowledge. And so you're supplementing your faith with knowledge. Does that mean there is no knowledge lead at that point? No, you're, you're growing in your faith by growing in your understanding. Growing, they work together. Faith and reason work together. That, that we reason our way to a certain point, but then we have to take a step of faith. And we take that step of faith, and then God uses that to help us to understand more of what, we're, what, what reason is telling us. And so then it, it's, it's like they both grow together. If we're only growing in one or only growing the other. I, I watched guys in seminary who were taking in all sorts of information, right? I mean, we went four years working on a THM, 126-hour master's program, a really long master's program. Most people are about 30 hours. Uh, but we were learning Hebrew, Greek. We were going through every book of the Bible. We were going through every aspect of theology. We went through the Bible theologically, biblically, uh, uh, liter literarily in the Greek and Hebrew. I mean, we were, uh, uh, in fact, there, uh, one of the things that I realized is, uh, man, I, I was taught the Bible. I wasn't taught how to grow a church or run a church. Uh, and that, that I had to kind of go talk to people about and figure that one out. But I, but I understood the scriptures and, and I realized that they both go together. And what I saw in, in, uh, uh, among students were guys that um, came from Bible college and then guys that came off of co secular college campuses. And those of us who, who came to Christ out of secular college campuses, we were on fire for the Lord. I mean, and not meaning the Bible guys weren't, but, but there was just something different about the guys that came off these secular colleges. We'd come to Christ. We were still new in our faith. And I watched how some guys kind of, their faith kind of ended up growing kind of cold. They became very academic. And, 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 the, and they love the academics of it. And, and I praise God for people who love academics because that's why we have a, a, a Bible that's translated from Hebrew and translated from Greek. Somebody had to learn Greek and Hebrew, right, to translate it for. So I praise God for that. But I also watched their hearts grow cold toward the Lord and toward evangelism. And I thought, that's something that's, that's really... Uh, was concerning to me. And it was something that I began to pray for. Lord, help me not to lose the simplicity, simplicity of devotion to Christ. And all the study that I do and all this, these different thinking as I think about my faith and think about apologetics and thinking about helping people reason their way through and, and believe and take that step of faith, I didn't want to lose that sense of just simple love for Christ, that simple relationship with our Lord. And I think that's something that we always got to stay on top of because otherwise it's easy to get enamored by so many things in this world and not, not just, uh, and, and so it's something that um, uh, to me, I want to continue to add knowledge, but I, I, want, it, I want my faith to continue to be strong. Uh, sometimes in fideism, it denigrates reason. Uh, fideism is uh, a theory which maintains that faith is independent of reason that they, they're completely independent of each other. And faith is superior at arriving to particular truths. Um, Immanuel Kant had this famous statement, deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. And you kind of go, what? I mean, when you first read that, you think deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. And, and, and there's a part of it that sounds, oh, that sounds kind of nice. But then you kind of realize, no, this is a problem with that. Because it's, it's putting down knowledge, it's putting down reason, it's, it's basically telling me to put my brain on the shelf. Um, some strict fideists 
assign no place to reason at all in discovering and understanding fundamental tenets of religion or faith. And so um, what is faith then? This is a picture I took myself. Uh, isn't that a great picture? Uh, I remember standing there. This was the uh, Horseshoe Bend in Arizona and a beautiful location. I thought that was a great picture for faith, right? Faith, Hebrews 11, 1 tells us, now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, what is that saying in regard to reason? Is it saying something in regard to reason? It isn't. It doesn't say faith is the assurance of, uh, of things without reason. It's saying faith is the assurance of things not seen. That's, there's a big difference between those two things. I can reason something and not see it. I can reason my way using taco, uh, the different arguments for the existence of God. I can reason my way to God, but I can't see God. And I won't see God until one day that I'm with him. And so there, it's important for us to understand sometimes when we're reading scripture, what it's saying, but also what it's not saying. So it's so easy for us to kind of read into, into scripture what, something that it doesn't say. That passage goes on in verse 3 to say, by faith, we understand. I thought that's an interesting juxtaposition of faith and understanding uh, 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 put together, that faith works together with reason, uh, uh, and that we understand that the world was created uh, by the word of God. Um, sometimes reason comes first. Uh, in Acts 17, Paul's in the Areopagus. He's uh, in Athens. Uh, he's uh, uh, beginning to speak to an audience that's all Greek. Uh, they've they've uh, taken him aside. They want to, to listen to what he has to say. Uh, he's been talking to them in the marketplace. He's actually walked among their temples. He's even read their literature because he talks about even as some of your own poets have said. I mean, you realize he's read their literature. He's, he's saying, oh, you've got a, a statue to an unknown God. Well, how did he know that? He walked through their temple and saw all the statues, right? And so uh, he was, he he studied there where they were coming from. And so they were interested. It says, so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers and some of the stuff that I'm dealing with comes, you know, even some has some early roots in Stoicism and, and in um, uh, Epicurean philosophy. They conversed with him and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And so even though he knew that they held a different worldview, he, he preached Jesus and the resurrection. He didn't back off from the gospel. But then he, he uh, also talked to them about, you know, God is, is whom we, in whom we live and move and have our being. And, and he says, I mean, he was using some of the different arguments for the existence of God. Some of the, uh, the cosmological argument, cause and effect. Uh, he was using design. And so when you read uh, uh, Acts 17, you realize he's doing some of what uh, I've been trying to put together here on this chart. And it was, it was one of this passage, this section of scripture was one of the influences for me as I was trying to put this together and realize, wow, Paul has in his mind a reasoned argument. He is reasoning with them. What's he hoping to do? He's reasoning with them, hoping they'll believe. And so what's coming first in this case? Reason. And then they will, will respond by faith. Uh, Another passage in Romans 10, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And so the word of God is an important part of this process. And so as we're sharing the word of God, we, ha we have to remember that, that uh, even if we don't have all the arguments down and we're sharing the word of God, God promises in Isaiah 55 that his word won't go out empty, but will accomplish what he intends. And so we need to understand there's power in the word of God. And it doesn't have to just be on us reasoning our way. In fact, I can sit there and have the best arguments ever. And if the Spirit of God is not moving in somebody's heart, it's just falling on deaf ears. If that person is not open to, to understanding, it falls on deaf ears. And even if they, they understand my arguments, they can go, man, these are great arguments. And then I say, well, the next step would be a step of faith. And go, well, I'm not sure I want to do that. I mean, that's the will at that point. And they can still choose, even if the arguments are the greatest arguments they've ever heard. They can, they can come to the point where they go, no, I don't want to take that step. And I've had that happen. 
where I've given sometimes my best presentation of this stuff. I mean, I have just, you know, felt like I knocked it out of the park and nothing. I mean, they're, they're not interested. There's been other times where I have fumbled the ball. I mean, I've tried to share Christ and I, it came in all wrong and I didn't say it right. And I felt like at the end, I was thinking, man, the, you know, I don't know how they ever got anything out of this. And they're like, and, and I see this response and they're like, I want to, I want to pray to receive Christ. And you're just like, I don't know how, how this even made any sense to you. Cause I mean, <laughs> I was all over the place. And, and, and yet they come to Christ and you realize it's not just about the arguments. Yeah, it's important for us to understand these things, but ultimately as we, we need to share Jesus Christ and him crucified. And it's the message itself that God has used and he, and he uses it over and over. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that we need to be lazy and go, oh, okay, yeah, there's some great arguments, but I, I, don't, I don't really care to learn them. I don't really care to understand this stuff. Now, the reason that I learned this stuff is because of evangelism. I'd go on uh, UTA's campus and I'd meet with students and I would share my faith with them. Sometimes it was people I'd just met. Sometimes it was people that I'd met on, on multiple occasions. And, and, they would, and, they would, uh, and, and when I was at University of Texas at Austin, I would share my faith. And, and, and people would come up with questions that I couldn't answer. And I, I went back and I wanted to find answers for them. I wanted to be able to show that, that our faith is reasonable. And what it did was it in the process, it strengthened my own faith because I realized there's some really deep and powerful arguments to our faith. And there's going to be times in your life where you may come to a point where you kind of go, man, why am I doing all this? Something particularly hard you face in life something that you weren't expecting, something that's so difficult that you, uh, that you find yourself just, I mean, just on your knees. I mean, we, we saw, we've seen that in our church recently. We saw that with, with Evan Brown. Uh, you know, I mean, can you imagine if, if the worst could, uh, would have happened there? I mean, God answered our prayer. Praise God. If the worst would have happened, what does that do to somebody's faith? What does that do to somebody in a family where they're struggling at that moment? Do they have answers? Do they have things that they can go back and go, oh, wait a minute, I know that there's a God. I know I exist because, you know, I think therefore I am. So I exist and therefore and not an infinite regress of cause. I mean, all these different things. And, 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 and you think your way through that process and you realize, no, there is a God. I know that, that it's reasonable to believe. And, and you find yourself, you're, you're strengthening yourself in your faith. And we see that in scripture. In fact, I was trying to remember uh, just now uh, that phrase, he strengthened himself in his faith. And I, I was just thinking, that's, we got to do that sometimes. There's times where, where life comes at us really hard, really strong. Emotions are powerful, overwhelming. And the question is, are we ready for those moments? And that we get ready for those moments in moments like these when we're not going through those kind of things and we think our way and be able to figure out, what do I believe? Um, Knowing is limited at this point. We have to remember that. We're not God. We're not going to know everything. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully. I've shared this at funerals, and, I've, and as I've thought about it in those settings, I just think, wow, I'm going to know fully at that moment, and I know in part right now. And that, just that thought is, is comforting. It's encouraging that there's going to be things that I'm going to understand then that I'm going to be standing before God and he's not going to necessarily, some things are just going to be intuitive. I'm going to, I'm going to get to heaven and go, oh, now I get it. You know, I didn't understand how this all worked. Now I get it on this particular thing or that particular thing. And there's going to be an understanding that we have, that we possess. We have limited minds. Our minds are tainted by sin. And because our minds are tainted by sin, uh, uh, they are going to see things through a wrong grid. They're going to see things that, are, that, uh, that aren't correct. And, and as a result, we come to the wrong conclusions because, we are, are, because of our own sinfulness, because of our own selfishness, because we're only seeing it through how it's impacting us. And as we do that, then, then uh, if we know there's going to come a day when I'm going to understand and I have to come to the, the point, do I believe, do I trust God? Do I believe that he is good? I mean, ultimately, that's what we have to come to. There is a point of faith where because, because we're limited in our knowledge. We all exercise faith. Every one of you exercise faith the day when you sat down. I mean, I could have sawed, you know, one of the legs on your chair, right? And you would have sat down and it would have just collapsed on you. You believed that that chair would hold your weight and you just sat in it. 
And in that case, it was fideism because you didn't check it out first. It wasn't, you know, but, but you went on reasonableness that last week it held you up and so it probably will hold you up this week and Greg's probably a good guy and he's not gonna saw the leg, right? And so there's that idea that, uh, that we all exercise faith. Uh, and uh, we all exercise faith when it comes to God, when it comes to uh, why there is something here. Even science uh, exercises a certain element of faith because none of us were sitting on the edge of nothingness or on the edge of whatever there, you know, on, on a ledge somewhere and watched creation happen and watched God speak the worlds into existence. We're all looking at the, the result and we're trying to make a logical, educated decision about why are things here and why are things the way they are. And so we're, we all exercise faith. The question is, is the object of our faith reasonable? And in fideism, the problem with fideism is it throws out this reasonable faith. It throws out this idea of reasonableness and it just says believe with, and regardless of reason. And, and, that, and that's a problem. And so um, it's self-defeating uh, uh, ultimately. While it's able to say, I can believe without reason. Is that a reasonable statement? Is that a statement of reason? It is. So I'm using reason to say I can't believe without reason. And so I'm making a faith statement using reason. And so it fails because I've just used reason to prove or disprove reason. So are there po positive contributions to uh, fideism? Yeah, there are a few. Uh, God is completely uh, beyond my, my reason's ability to reason my way to God. I mean, I can reason that God exists. I can't, put, I can't reason my way and see him. I can't see him through reason. Neither evidence nor reason alone is the basis for one's commitment to God. I put my faith in Christ because of who he is, because of, uh, of what he has done for me. And apologetics cannot produce faith in Christ. That's a step that we do have to take on our own. Kierkegaard isn't right that it's a blind leaf of faith, but it is a step of faith in the direction that reason points. And so that when we think about this idea of faith, and this is an important issue when we think about faith, I mean, our whole, our whole salvation rests on our, on our belief in who Jesus is, right? And so faith is an important thing to understand and to understand what it is not. And that's what my hope is today, is to help you to see what faith is and what it is not. Because I think that, that uh, uh, there are false views of what faith is. Uh, Faith in God is not mere intellectual assent. It's a heart commitment. When you think about this idea of what, what does it take? What is faith? I mean, we've wrestled with this before. I mean, I've wrestled with this in, in, uh, uh, in seminary is, is, is how do you define what faith is? And what, how do you know when a person has actually come to Christ? How do you know when one of your kids has actually received Christ and when they have not? How do you know when they've taken that step of faith? I have to, I have to determine that all the time whenever I do any kind of baptism and, and, and I'm, I'm interviewing the person beforehand and saying, you know, asking them for their testimony and they give this testimony and Sometimes it's unclear and I'm trying to figure out, do they really believe? Do they not believe? And I, in fact, I remember uh, uh, there was a couple that wanted to join our church years ago, over 20 years ago. They wanted to join our church. And so Susan and I went over to their house and we sat around their dinner table and, and heard the wife's testimony, very clear statement of I believed on Jesus. And then I listened to the man's testimony and he, his testimony was, well, I you know, tried to be good. And I was thinking, man, he doesn't have a testimony. He, doesn't, he hasn't believed on Jesus. And so I can't let them join. But how am I going to tell him that, you know, in a, a gracious way of, hey, you really need to receive Christ. And so I shared the gospel and said, here's what the gospel is. And, you know, and, and tried to press someone on that issue. And he just, he just didn't, he, it wasn't a clear testimony. Uh, he didn't, I, I don't think he was a believer at that point. And so, um, uh, fortunately, uh, something happened with one of the kids. Uh, I say fortunately, we, our, you know, Brad was playing with their kids and somebody fell down the stairs. I don't remember what happened. No, they weren't hurt bad, but they, you know, they're crying. Everybody jumps up from the table and runs to, and I, and I said, well, we got to go. And we took off. <laughs> okay. I was a chicken. I, I admit that. But, um, uh, but he started coming to a Saturday morning Bible study that I was having. And, and when he showed up, 
I decided, okay, I'm going to change the, uh, what I had planned, and I'm going to just say, here's how we need to learn how to share our faith with the other guys, you know, obviously. And so I, I showed how to do the bridge illustration and how to do the Roman road and how to do my Isaiah interstate and, and just kind of shared the gospel about four or five different ways during that time. I said, you know, to make it clear. To make, and I said, we got to make the message clear. It's not about works. It's about faith. And so when we prayed, I said, hey, if any of you guys haven't received Christ, you know, now would be a great time. And, and so here in this Bible study with four or five guys, you know, we prayed. And, uh, you know, he kept coming on Saturday morning uh, about... Uh, Three or four months went by. It was December, and, and um, he uh, came up to me after our study and said, uh, I'm ready to, uh, uh, to join the church. And I said, well, what's changed? And he says, I've received Christ as my Savior. I said, really? And so I, I asked him about it, very clear testimony of believing on Jesus. And I was thinking, wow. And I said, when did, that, when did you do that? And he said, I did it the very first Saturday when, when, when you were talking about the gospel. And, and I, I received Christ. And that was four months before. He took four months to tell me. And so I said, um, have you told your wife about it? And he goes, no, you think I should? <laughs> yeah, I think that'd be a good idea. It was a Saturday, right? He comes back on Sunday. Man, she was mad at me. And so she says, I've been praying for you all this time, and you received Christ, and you didn't tell me for four months. You know, it was just like I was laughing. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, there, there, you can't make somebody take that step. You can only help them to see that it's reasonable to take that step to put their faith in Christ. And then they have to take that step on their own. Um, faith in God's uh, not just intellectual assent. It's not just knowing the facts. It's actually taking that step of having Jesus be your savior. Uh, and, and of course, we, we can debate all, uh, all day long. Is it with a prayer? Is it, you know, how does, you know, because that's, that's the, the question is, do you have to pray a prayer to come to Christ? And, you know, and that's been a debated topic among a lot of theologians over the years. And, and, uh, uh, and you think about it and you realize, well, it just says faith. It doesn't say a prayer. Now you could go to Romans 10 and, uh, you know, uh, but um, when, you, when you look at it, it really comes down to it's a faith. It's a step of faith that I believe. I believe on Jesus. In fact, a lot of times by the time you prayed the prayer, you've already believed before you prayed that prayer. And so did the faith and your salvation happen right before you prayed the prayer? I mean, I don't know. But it's also kind of, uh, you look at a wedding ceremony and you think, when, do they, when are they married? It's when they make this covenant with one another. And so there is an idea of this covenanting together with God. Uh, and, and we do that by faith in Jesus. Uh, man's sinful condition affects his response to God, not just his reason. Um, and so... Um, what are some of the critiques of fideism? It fails to distinguish between belief in and belief that. Reason will lead you to belief that. Faith is whenever you believe in what reason points you to. They don't differentiate be, uh, between the basis of belief in God and the support or warrant for that belief. Or it neglects and sometimes virtually negates the need for propositional truth such as in the Bible. So all of a sudden, you're waiting, why do I have the Bible if I can just believe and I don't need a reason to believe? Uh, God gave his word for a reason, and he gave it in a reasonable fashion, and it's, and it's reasons why we should believe. Uh, the crucial question is not whether we can avoid using presuppositions, but whether we can justify those. Now, the minute you say that, that goes to this next one. If fideism offers justification for a belief, then you're no longer a fideist because you've just used reason, right? Uh, and then my uh, final uh, slide in this thing is uh, through the looking glass. Uh, uh, she says, I can't believe that. She, the, the queen is, yeah, sorry. The queen is, is basically saying that uh, she's 101 years old in a few days and stuff. And it's right, right after, you know, she asked Alice, how old are you? And she says, seven years and a half or six months exactly. And she says, why do you say exactly? And so anyway, she tells her how old she is. He says, I can't believe that, says Alice. Can't you, the queen said in a pitying tone. Try again. Draw a long breath. Shut your eyes. Alice laughed. There's no use trying, she said. One can, can't believe impossible things. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the queen. When I was your, way, your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. 
And obviously a statement of fideism, right? And, and, and you think it's all through our literature, all through different our movies, it's, it's everywhere, this idea of fideism that passes for faith. And this idea that, that we don't need our reason in order to justify why we believe what we believe. But the reality is everything that we have in scripture points to and helps us to understand uh, that we have a reasonable faith. We have, a, have great reasons to believe. Uh, uh, Paul in the Areopagus in Acts 17, he's talking to the audience. He has, he's giving them reasons to believe in Jesus. And so as we look at that, we need to understand that and understand that, there, that this is, um, uh, uh, we don't put our brain on the shelf. We think. And that, that these kind of things that I, I'm exposing to, to you to, and I know I'm exposing you to a lot. I mean, some of these terms and ideas you haven't been exposed to before. And to me, I think it's the soft underbelly of our faith. And it's the reason why sometimes we, we have people that, that walk away from the faith because they haven't been exposed to just some simple things to help them to think through their faith. And so somebody asks them a tough question and they don't know how to answer it. And because they don't know how to answer, they think there isn't an answer. And because they haven't heard that answer at church, they think the church doesn't have an answer either. And so we need to, to uh, you know, our, the people around us need us to understand the basis for our faith and what it is and what it's not. Our faith is not just a blind belief, a, a leap into the unknown. Our faith is something that's reasonable and that's an assurance of things hoped for, a conviction of things not seen. And so um, my application is the same this week as it's been every week. I want to encourage you, talk about these things. Talk about them with someone in your family. Talk about them with one another. See what you remember. See what you understand. You'll, you'll figure out what you understand by, by talking to one another. You'll start saying, and say, well, I think it's this. And, no, I think he said this. No, I, I think, it, and you'll find yourself going back and forth. That's okay. Because as you go back and forth, what you'll realize is, is that uh, uh, you'll, you'll get sharper on these things and you'll go back and you'll have questions that you'll ask and you may come and ask me or you may ask somebody else in the class and you'll say, now wait a minute, what is this fideism thing? I don't seem to quite wrap my mind around this thing. <laughs>